We're trying to put, we're trying to retire, early retire in five years where people usually spend 40 years of their life trying to do. Right. And like, that's why we're pushing and that's the grind because we're compressing that 40 year retirement into like five years. Thank you so much for joining us on the Evolve Your Brand podcast. I am your host, Ole Merkies, and I just want to give a huge shout out to Icon Industry, Shane, Stephen. I hope you're enjoying your vacation with the family in Tennessee and the rest of the wonderful people here at Icon. We couldn't do it without you. We appreciate you. And today, for the first time on purpose, we have two guests that I'm very, very excited about Aubrey Carlson and Brad Hilton. Mm -hmm. I said it right, right? You did, you Hilton? Got it right. Yeah. I yeah. got it. Because I saw the why. Brad spells <laughs> a little differently. And not only are they a beautiful couple, uh, I think what what the reason why I'm so excited to have you on is to talk about the path path of risk. Mm -hmm. That's really what I'm excited to talk talk to both of you about. Cause I've been, you know, I've gotten to know you guys over the past like few months. And I love your energy for life, like that, that constant pushing, that drive. And I think those are the stories that we need to tell. What do you guys think? Welcome to the show, by the way. Thank you. Yay. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Let's rock and roll. So let's start with that. Like, what? It, how come you push both of you so hard in life? Aubrey, you go first. Well, we've been pushing really hard for the past couple of years, hard to like to breaking points. I'll have like multiple mental breakdowns, but it's OK. <laughs> and Brad put it. Um, this was like maybe last year or something, because we have a goal of financial freedom. OK, we have a goal of we want to be free with our time and right. have passive or even like active, like our own businesses, active income. Um, and when, you know, <laughs> You're like crying every day um, sometimes in that like grind point. He was like, okay, you have to think about we're trying to put, we're trying to retire, early retire in five years where people usually spend 40 years of their life trying to do. Right. And like, that's why we're pushing. And that's mm. the grind because we're compressing that 40 year retirement into like five years. That's hot. So <laughs> when you that is, in that, that, that's hot. <laughs> that, that's our opening right there. That's a, that, that is a great way to articulate. Yeah. That was impressive. What about you? What, what's, what's the, what's the long game with financial freedom? What does that mean for Brad? Well, the long game for financial freedom is to be able to work on what we want to work on. It's not to quit working. It's to level up and work on more things that become more meaningful hmm. but to be able to have that comfort or stability of like i don't have to go to this other job so then i can go do and what i really want to do it's creating something that enables you to then do these cool projects that you really like, right. but sometimes you don't even know what that project is. Like you don't know what the next mountain is until you get over the first one. And so the first one for us is let's get time freedom. What's time freedom? That's, you know, income freedom. And then as these new hills pop up, we'll figure out how to tackle those too. And it's not very going to be something that's like free of the fear of acting or the hustle, but you have different levels of which you're working towards. And so to me, that time freedom is being able to look over the next hill and be like, okay, I want to go there versus like, I have to just stay on this path until I'm 65 and then I can chase something I think is cool. Like that doesn't, that seems more risky than not. Like that to me is it, why. It makes no sense. Like, you know, when I reflect on the things that we learn from our parents, like, when you sit down and you reflect on it, you're like, this shit doesn't make any sense. Why would I want? Yeah. Wait a minute. Uh, I'm going to work all my life to make somebody else wealthy while I struggle in life to not live the life I want. And oftentimes unhealthy. Very. You know, yeah. it touches Ooh, all your that's time, yeah. you know? Okay. So you owned a yoga studio. Yoga? Yoga? yoga. What the fuck? That's yoga. like Yoda. Yoda's yoga. Yeah, Yoda's it was a yoga, yoga studio. Yep. For nine years. Nine years. I taught yoga for 15 Okay. So I started when I was, yeah, 21 in college teaching yoga. Um, 
But yeah, the fitness level of like going back to nine to five, it's a lot of people just, they fit in where they can. And oftentimes if you've got kids and other things, and maybe you're doing a nine to five, plus you're working on your own business, then that falls away of, you know, like we're talking before, not putting yourself first. So you get to 65 on this retirement and you're so far out of whack with your body and healthy that you really can't even live those good years anymore. Yeah, And that to me seems crazy that's i think it's another reason we push so hard it's like that seems so much far scarier than doing what we're doing right now scarier i'd rather do this than that that seems crazy yeah and and i think that's uh it was so funny when you were when you when we were talking about stories and i'm listening to you and i'm like you know at 47 to learn the things i have in the past year i'm like fuck, I got to learn this so much easier. <laughs> what are, what are like, let, let's jump into like your stories. Like w- you're from California. Mm-hmm. Aubrey, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Illinois. Illinois? Yeah. Oh. California. <laughs> Illinois. California I get it. of the Midwest. <laughs> I get it. I get it. So Aubrey, we're, Talk about like where you grew up, how you became a freaking Navy pilot. Let's dig into that. And I want to hear all about it. Let's take five minutes and talk about you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, I grew up on like a five generation farm. I grew up in the same house my dad grew up in. Yeah, crazy. That's- yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> um, and yeah, and then, but I, you know, I had amazing parents. I had an amazing childhood. I, I have two siblings, and my dad unfortunately passed away a couple years from cancer. Oh, I'm years sorry. Ago from cancer, but. Yeah, at a pretty young age. I mean, he was like mid 60s. So I'm very passionate about like health and not smoking and all that kind of stuff that. So anyways, but we had a great childhood with him and he always pushed us. And for some reason, because um, when you're in a small town, you usually stay in a small town, you usually don't get out of the small town. It's very rare for people to get out of the small town and do something bigger. But for some reason, I always had this drive to do that. And I wanted to get as far away as possible from the farm. <laughs> um and the furthest place my parents would let me go was Maryland. So I went to University of Maryland. And then I did ROTC because that was the only way I could pay for college. I was like, yeah, why not? Um, my you're, parents. You're a terpin? Yeah, terrapin. Terrapin. I don't think I've ever said that right. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I, I just got corrected. <laughs> terrapin? I don't terrapin? even know if I've heard that word. Fear so. the turtle. Don't feel bad. I, I know. That's what I'm saying. I don't get it. Yeah. Fear the turtle? <laughs> fear the turtles. Are... <laughs> teenage and... When were we talking about Teenage, teenage Mutant Ninja, Ninja Turtles? I fear yeah. those turtles. <laughs> so you went to ROTC to pay for school. Yeah, that was like the only reason. I'm like, there's no other way I can get out Got of it. Illinois. Okay. Because we had no money. Like, I had no money. Like, my parents didn't have money for college. So I was like, I have to get a full scholarship. Uh, my brother went to the Naval Academy. So my parents did take me there. And it's like that induction day. And I saw it all happen. And, and my dad was like, yeah, you want to go? And I'm like, absolutely not. So I went and had the public school experience right next to the Naval Academy while my brother was at the Naval Academy. And um, yeah, I did the ROTC thing. And I thought the pilot thing was the coolest thing ever. So I'm like, why not do that? So then got into flight school and... But tell me about the flight school thing, though. That was cool. Yeah, well, so I got in as a uh, backseater. Okay. They call that a navigator. And so I went to flight school as a navigator and I didn't have money to do eye surgery. So then I somehow talked my way into me getting to flight school and getting LASIK surgery. And they let me do it somehow. I have no idea why. And then you can't switch from navigator to pilot that's not a thing unless you get like first in your class so then i i like worked my butt off and i I don't know it's so rare like they call it the purple unicorn i think is what they call it when you switch from navigator to pilot because you're already set and you're going there's no reason for them to switch you so then i ended up getting switched to pilot and then went that route and then started flying and then got helicopters and then i've actually been in san diego Ever since the beginning of my career, I guess that was 2015 when I first started flying like the actual Navy helicopters because you do about three years in Florida in flight school. And then you were here. three years in flight school before you can fly? Well, you do like you're right. flying um, the smaller planes and right. stuff. And then it's like three years until you fly what you're going to fly in the Navy. Holy shit. So you're a purple unicorn? 
But I, I don't know what that's what they I mean, you yeah. just <laughs> yeah. so Brad, you heard that you're my witness. Well, she's she told me before and it's like uh, your top score in that class you're in is a combination of your physical fitness yes. and your written exams, right? Oh, yeah. And that was the thing, actually, is there was one guy who beat me out but it was a combination of your physical fitness. And the only reason I got number one is because I beat him in physical fitness. Boom. <laughs> but, Boom. But yeah. And then because, yeah, so, so crazy. So how does it feel to be such a badass? <laughs> I'm just curious, like. I wish I could buy them. I mean, at least you yeah. fly. Yeah, but Brad, I, I like, mean, you got to keep up. Like, you no, know, I tell she, people she can't be in the air without you. The amount of the fuel that her aircraft takes it weighs more than my entire plane with fuel, everything. And I'm just like, and how does that make you feel? Not very big. No, right? <laughs> You're a real man, bro. I just got. I want to tell you. What was the best? Uh, what was the best part of the three years of training? What was the one thing that you took away? Like you said something powerful to me last week. It was crazy about how you, you know, your, your focus was the mission and the people. Oh yeah. Cause I didn't really have a chance to even think or s about entrepreneurship until I was like done flying because all you're focusing on is just keeping yourself safe and keeping the other crew members safe. Mm. But uh, in flight school, so you always have like an instructor with you. Um, and then you go on and then you learn how to fly. I learned how to fly the MH-60 Romeo, you learn how to fly that. And then you go out on your deployments and stuff. And then, yeah, that's all you can care about because all you care about is keeping yourself safe and your crew members safe. And I had no, no other distractions. That's it. And so I didn't even think about starting my own business or doing any kind of side hustles because you don't have any room for it um, until I was out of the cockpit and like a different job um, with the Navy and then got into that. Um, one takeaway I had, I was thinking about how come you're so brave when it comes to real estate, like decisions, you know, it's very hard for people. That makes sense. You were in charge of people's lives. Yeah. And actually th we talk about this a lot and I think about this really? all the time. Interesting. Well, I feel like, because yeah, when you're like on the back of a ship, like 20 feet away from the water with on night vision goggles with like the seas going crazy, you're trying to land or just uh, the other crazy shit that we did, um, you, yeah, you're just, other stuff doesn't scare you. Yeah. You know? Does it blow your mind what you accomplished as, as you were in the Navy? I mean, that seems crazy to me that you could, like you have all factors that are going wrong and you got to make great decisions. Yeah, it blows my mind. It feels like a totally different life. I feel like it just, it, it feels like it just all happened and it was a dream. And now I'm here. It's so weird. I'll try to bring it back sometimes. We're like picking up paint colors. Like, I don't know. I'm like, you fly helicopters. We can figure this Ooh. out. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, I don't want to know the trouble you get into sometimes. <laughs> Honey, I think we should take this into perspective. Like you <laughs> landed. Okay. Yeah. I'll try to bring it back to that sometimes because it does relate in, it, in its it, own way. It's crazy. Like it just hit me. I'm like, oh, okay. Because it's the fear decisions, you yeah. know, and that that's one thing that I, I really am curious. Like how do people go through hard times in their life like what shapes our character or identity you talked about mindset and i think that's really what it comes down to is trying to understand people's mindsets yeah and it has been i mean there's some flights either if you're as a second pilot or as an aircraft commander and you're like holy shit this fucking sucks or this mission fucking sucks but i have to make it back home like there's no other way right like we have to land and we have to land safely but this fucking sucks. and you have to make you have to just push and push and push. So I think that's where a lot of that's come from. And with Brad, I mean, owning the yoga studio for nine years, it was push every single day so you can like live, you yeah. know, so it wasn't easy to own a yoga studio and make no money. Just like, it's not easy of like being in a hell, you know, in a crappy situation, a helicopter and trying to land safely. So. Yeah. It's those experiences. What was the best lesson you learned from an instructor that you apply to your life every day? Oh, he was like, Always look cool and sound cool on the radios. <laughs> <laughs> You're definitely in fashion. <laughs> sound cool and look cool. Yeah, on the yeah. How the fuck do you look cool? I'm sorry. This is we cuss on this. How the fuck do you look cool on the radio? 
Oh, How do you accomplish that? I don't. Well, no, I think he just meant in general, but he's like, look cool in the cockpit, sound cool on the radio. Yeah. You're a fucking helicopter pilot. <laughs> what would you have to do not to look cool? <laughs> Some people do not sound well in the radios, but he's like, and I just took that. I'm like, okay. That's I don't so know. Cool. I always remember that. That was like really early in my flight school. I have an idea for you <laughs> for your next Airbnb, a pilot thing. I know. I really would love to do that, especially because we're both pilots mm-hmm. and the name of our. Uh, short-term rental management company, design company is Salt and Sky Lodging Co. Yeah. Because it's the salt of the the sea. He loves to surf. And then we both fly. It'd be sick okay. to have it in like a hangar. There are certain yeah, places hangar. where you, if you had a hangar that you convert, my Ooh. buddies have done that legally gray area-esque <laughs> where they have a hangar for their aircraft. And then they built a loft up top that they live in part-time. And so if you had oh, something like that, it would be really cool okay. for the aviation Dream. enthusiasts because then you're on the airport and it's like, it's all this cool stuff. Brad, it's creativity. You know, it's creativity. You got to be creative. Opportunities happen from creativity. So Brad, let's dig into you, buddy. You mm-hmm. went to, we're you, our ma- alma mater. You went to San Diego yep, State, right? Same. Yep. Yep. You're a Cali boy? Cali boy. I know. Grew up. And, and we're going to have the audience guess your age. <laughs> right, tell you what it is. So drop a comment. How old do you think Brad is? Because you're getting it a fucking wrong. I wasn't even close. Uh, talk about your story. Like, where'd you grow up? Like, how did Brad get here with Aubrey? Yeah, I grew up in Santa Cruz, which is a cool little surfer outdoor town up in Northern California. I didn't really realize how good I had it up there until you start to become older and you start to see all of the things that a young kid that had a ton of energy could do because it was just an outdoor playground so everybody it wasn't weird it was just normal in fact it was weird you didn't snowboard surf skateboard rock climb bike play three different sports everything like that was just all your friends did that that wasn't everybody went to junior guards everybody went to the snow everybody was skateboarding like I thought that was just the normal thing that so everybody cool. did. I know, right? <laughs> no, but it's just like, but to your, awesome. to Can your peers. Your sound cool and look cool. Exactly. You got both of those down. Safety third. <laughs> um, so I, I grew up doing all those kind of things. And I got lucky playing a lot of competitive sports when I was younger. I got to, um, they have like, I didn't realize that they have like junior Olympics for everything. So I got really? to play hockey, Junior Olympics oh, in, shit. in New York when I was 11. And wow. then um, that was a cool set. I think sports is such a strong discipline and driver that you get immediate feedback. And I was really, I think I just, because I grew up in a, my mom was a junior or a, um, it was a police Olympic Academy. So the police have their own Olympics. The firefighters have their own Olympics. My mom went to that for being a swimmer. So I had this drive, I think, hmm. growing up to be very competitive and just be into sports. So then I got into a soccer team. I got to travel through Europe playing soccer and I was on the U.S. national team. So I get to have that like early life playing soccer. And that's what I thought I was going to go do. That's why I love <laughs> fucking what is this dynamic, what, dynamic couple in san diego yeah i just went to europe and played fucking soccer manchester city is playing today i'm very excited mm, that so, would be yeah okay um, so you're you're you went to new york for hockey then to europe what's next brad uh, and then i i got offered i think i just kind of like i played too much of one thing when okay. i was like so i got so into it that all of your weekends were only soccer, right. all of your, you never had free time anymore, which is if that's the path and that's where you want to go. But somewhere along the way, I, I kind of lost, wanted to be like, I want to hang out with my friends and okay. and have a, so I, I got some offers for school and then I just chose to not play soccer anymore once I got to college and I went to San Diego State. And then I just discovered San Diego is kind of like a bigger version of Santa Cruz. It's like, there's tons of great surf. The weather's even better. You can get to the mountains. You can go to the desert. It was just killer. Um, and then through college, I had various jobs. And one of them was a pedicab driver. We talked about this downtown. That was an awesome job because you're kind of like your own boss Did we again. Talk about that? No. Oh, no. yeah. We talked about that after that event. 
Oh, oh okay, yeah. yeah. I wasn't. I'm like pedicab. Man, so I like, remember that one. I remember Vegas. Yeah, and the okay. stories in yeah, Vegas. Yeah. I don't remember the oh, pedicab. Yeah, no, I lived in Vegas too. But this was before that. So I, my buddy was like, "Oh, dude, like this job's pretty killer. I make you know a hundred bucks or more a night being a pedicab driver." And back then, when you're 19, you're like, "Sweet, that's killer," and you got to pick your own hours. So. We'd go down and you'd rent the pedicab from the owners and the owners liked me and my buddy. So we didn't have to pay that fee, which was nice, but it was only like 35 bucks. Okay. But we were like the only two guys that spoke clear English. And on a pedicab, the rules are you can solicit. So you can go on the street and yell out to people, hey, do you want to ride? Do you want to ride? Blah, blah, blah. And so we figured out if we rode down the street together and we offered people to race each other in our pedicabs to their destination, we would pick up the ride and we'd make a ton more money. And so we would just do that all night. And instead of making like a hundred bucks, you'd make like 200 bucks a night. And then we figured out you could go to Del Mar and you could bring the pedicab up there and you could make six or $700 a day riding for like 13 hours. And that kind of got me on that like, oh, if you just put in effort, you can get different outcomes for business. And that I think, opened my mind to that a little further. And then through college, I started teaching yoga. I fell in love with that process. I uh, ended up opening my own yoga studio and PB. How'd you get into yoga? So this is, a, I was with a buddy one night at a bar in PB and <laughs> It's just how it's happened out. Okay, this is not how I thought this story would go. <laughs> hey, guys, how'd you get into yoga? I was with this dude. Yeah. At a fucking One bar. One of my best buds. <laughs> Brad and Chad. Yeah, exactly. And PB. And uh, he was... He was Brad like, and Chad, bro. Does it get any more? No, Caucasian? it was Brad and Zach. But yeah. oh, is it Brad and Zach? Yeah, Did I get the name wrong. No, yeah. I, Chad, no, Zach. No, Brad and Chad works for PB though. Yeah. So. I'm with my buddy and it's like 10 o'clock at night. And he's like, Hey, I got it. My friend asked me to go bring him a bottle of goose for a hundred dollars downtown. Okay. And I was like, who's going to pay you a hundred dollars to bring a bottle. He's like, you got to meet him. He's super cool. I'm like, there's girls out here. What, do, why are we leaving the bar? This is a Friday night. And he was like, no, 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 you got to meet him. And I was like, all right, fine, let's go. So we cab down, we grab this guy, a bottle of gray goose. We bring it up and he's in this like really nice, condo at the top of a building in downtown little Italy and we get to the door and he hands us each a hundred dollars and I was like whoa and but we just kind of start hanging out with him and he's super cool and his girlfriend couldn't be nicer and he owned core power yoga and his girlfriend at the time was the general manager for one of the studios he only had one in San Diego at that point and so we hung out all night till the sun came up and she was showing me all these crazy balancing poses and they were just so captivating. And by the end of it, they're like, you should teach yoga. And I'm like, I've never done yoga. And they're like, you should teach yoga. And I was like, they're come take Trevor's class was his name um, on Sunday and see how you like it. And I was like, all right, I'll come. So I went the following Sunday, the next day. I went and took a class and it was killer. The guy could like, it was like magic. He was walking on his hands. He was joking with everybody. He was playing cool music. And I was like, this is yoga. This is not what I thought yoga was at all. Um, and so I was like, this is super cool. And on Wednesday, they had their first day of teacher training for their newest one. And so that Wednesday, I joined teacher training. So I'd never done yoga except for one class and I joined teacher training. And I was like, sweet, you guys are cool. Let's do it. Are you still buddies with Zach? Uh, Zach's still one of my best buds. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Trevor, the owner of Core Power, he yeah. passed away, unfortunately. Oh, shit. Yeah, it was kind of a tragic accident. Okay. Um, but he was a good friend. He became like a mentor right. of mine. Yeah. We became really good buddies. I watched over his house. I watched over his dogs. I was gone. He was kind of taking me under his wing with real estate back in 2006, too. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. He was he was super cool. And then I just kind of went down that that realm and I taught at Core Power for five years or so. And then when I was finally done with college um, and ready to start a new business, I was just like, well, I'll just start a yoga studio. And I opened up one across the street from his. <laughs> <laughs> How'd that go? 
He laughed about it. it. We were such a small spec. He had like 10 in San Diego at that point. We, oh, got it. Got so it. we were such a small thing. Yeah. He was like, I get it. Like, that's cool. He was very helpful and helped me out with it too. Beautiful. He didn't see me as a threat. Not at all. You know, he was very cool. Yeah. About it. But you earned that though. It was, it was a journey. Do you know what I mean? Like, those are the moments, uh, like when you invest in people like Trevor investing in you, it, the reason why I brought up Zach, like, isn't it a cool moment? Like, how you met Trevor was because of Grey Goose. Yeah. No, I'm serious. Like, that's the story. <laughs> yeah. Like, had you not gone with him. Yeah. You wouldn't have. Completely changed my whole you know, life. One decision. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. it, we talk. It happens all, like, just one little decision. Yes. Just alters the course of your life. You got to show up. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. It changed my whole mindset about health. And what I was already healthy but like that whole path of like what yoga is and keeping healthy and i think about all the nights that you go out and then you do yoga the next day and it just keeps you young like it's just yeah. i've seen some people that are in their 70s that look like they're 40 it's yeah. crazy and they've got the energy of a 30 year old they're just it's just such a cool thing that can be done wrong or right yeah, I think what's attractive about both of you is like how you incorporate things that matter into your life together. Like, I think that's, you know, having been divorced, that was the one thing like I never understood was unity. Mm. Oh, yeah. And I mean, we both have, you know, a strong dating history of like dating other people. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know where that came from. No, no, no. Okay, let's but, dive in. Yeah. I'm in. <laughs> Done, Aubrey. Go. Field. <laughs> I'm, I'm really curious where you're going with this. Well, but the thing I think that brought us together is when we realized that our lifestyle and our outlook on health and wellness and what we want out of life was so aligned. And that's what I think brought us together mm -hmm. to be able to be like, okay, let's be life partners. Oh, no. no. that, that was it. I mean, it was, it's hard to find someone that yeah. totally aligns with what you want to do every day and what you want out of life. Amen. Yeah. I think it's so unique. Like, I think the toughest thing is parenting. And then the second toughest thing is relationships because it devolves so much emotion. Like business, I think is easy. Business to me doesn't involve any emotions. It's just fact. Yeah. I wouldn't know anything about parenting, but that sounds tough. <laughs> hey, you do. You have, you have spirit in JJ. Oh, yeah, you two, know what I mean? Dogs. It's like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I like dogs better than some people. <laughs> So do we. <laughs> they have um, their own turmoil that you have to deal with for sure. What, what gave you the balls to go into entrepreneurship after graduating? Most people wouldn't do that. I just, I think it's, I've never had that problem of just pulling the trigger and just going all in. I don't what, know. What prepared you in life to be able to do that? I think it was, again, traveling back to like sports hmm. and like alternative sports especially like snowboarding and things where you have to commit fully or you're going to, that's when you're going to hurt yourself. So if you're going off, like one of my buddies is really good at snowboarding, can throw huge backflips off of like 30 foot kickers. And we would challenge each other to like, all right, you go, I go Rochambeau and you have to commit. And this is just like a small piece of that. But like I found on the times when I'm like, I'm kind of scared and I'm holding back and you go off something or commit to a big wave or whatever. Those are the times you actually get hurt. But when you like fully commit, like there's just this, there's no return. So you just go. And for some reason, I just have that in my head that it's easier for me to just fully commit on something than just go partially in. And I... I think it stems from a childhood of that, of just kind of like committing to sports or whatever. And that's translated later in life to like, oh, we're going to go open this business and we're going to fully commit to just investing in real estate or what have you. So I think some of those younger experiences have helped shape my mindset of like, it's actually safer to go all in than to hold something back. What about that story of when you did the solar in college? Oh yeah, that sucked. I did two door to door knocking jobs, nice. like door to door sales. But that's that amazing. Was, How was that? It was like, rough. About that. It, was, it was horrible, yeah. but it, in, in a good way. Like yeah. you're nineteen, twenty, knocking on doors, and people don't like you on their porch. But it gave you this like, 
hey, I can have a conversation with anybody, yeah. you know, and it, you're trying to sell them something at the front door at their worst time of the day or like that's the last thing you want, you know, to have to make time for some kid trying to like set an appointment for solar or set an appointment to paint your house. So it's both companies, but it toughens you up. It makes you it makes you better, gives you confidence with just having a conversation with anybody. Weren't you sitting in an office, though, for one of them? Uh, no, that was an internship. I oh, okay, had. so it was an internship. That was the one where I was like, that's when I was trying to get into the military because I was also tried to fly. Oh, but really? I had bad eyes. I had really bad eyes as a okay. kid. Well, we have that in common. Yeah. Do you have? I need LASIK in one. Oh, okay. I learned something about LASIK. Like, you don't do it in both eyes. Like, if one is inferior, like, it, I'm nearsighted and farsighted. It's hilarious. Oh, interesting. So you only do it in one eye. It's crazy. You can get it. My dad had it, and they had to, they fixed far side and near side on the other. So he huh. can see one eye is for close-up reading. The other one's for seeing far away. And yeah. His brain kind of adjusted. Weird. Okay. Um, no, but the internship, I had, had to do something for school. And I remember sitting in an office, and I remember... I was like, this is so awful. And all these uh, fighter jets, because over at Miramar, we're flying overhead. And I'm like, how can I get anything done when like the coolest job on the planet is just rushing by me and I'm stocking boxes on a shelf? And I was like, this is so, I don't know how people do office work. Right. Like, I cannot do this. Yeah. Because I had to like sit and type in what it was and then go put it on the shelf. And it was just, I couldn't do that. But I, you know, I had that experience to know. I think it's just as important to know what you don't want. But you have to have that experience, you know. Well, it's experimenting, and and I'm sharing with the boys right now. I'm like, experiment with different things. This is the time you do it because you figure out what you want and you what you don't want. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, <clears throat> so let's talk about real estate. I think the coolest thing. Um, I'm going to talk about Buddy rushing and Kimberly l- rushing for a second, and then you go. I've learned a valuable lesson. First and first and foremost, Buddy and Kimberly are amazing human beings. Yes. Like for I uh, just blown away at who they are, how sincere and upfront they are. I didn't realize you could succeed in real estate as novices. And I'm not saying they're novice, but I've met so many people in White Feather that have no connection to real estate and it's mind blowing. How did this real estate thing, you said Trevor was impactful for mm-hmm. real estate. Mm-hmm. Like, how did you get the real estate bug? Well, we didn't. So the first real estate purchase we both made was together. And that was nice. for a primary home in 2020. Okay. And honestly. That I was knew- the first one was 2020? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So, so this is October recent. 2020. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So it's only been. Three, three years. years. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So. Went from negative net worth to over a million dollars in net worth in three years just through buying real estate and grinding over it. And that's mostly San Diego appreciation. Okay. So, I mean, people talk shit on like buying in San Diego. It's so expensive. But I mean, like the appreciation here is just. Yeah. You you know, here's the thing, Aubrey. What I've learned is if you don't have smart money people explaining money for you, that's where you can't, you don't get enough guidance to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so I didn't, I had the VA loan. Yeah. Um, yeah. And <laughs> thank I, you for your service. But like, and congratulations on the VA loan. <laughs> it's so funny because we were, because we were getting serious. We're like, okay, well, let's um, go rent a place in North PB together. Okay. And I start sending him these things and it's like five grand of rent. Yeah. It was like five grand to rent a spot. Like, yeah. It's crazy. But this is still like even three years ago, four yeah, it's years 2020. ago. 2020. Now that place is probably eight, nine grand. It just blew my mind. I'm like, yeah. so why don't we just buy something then? Nice. Well, and that was back when the mortgage was going to be less than the rent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So I'm like, oh, okay. And I really had no savings. He had a little bit of savings because I just wasn't good with money in my 20s. So oh, yeah. Okay. And, and Let's talk about that. What does not being good with money mean? What's your definition of not being good with money? Just not seeing it as a tool, Mm. I think is the biggest. I never saw it as a tool in my life. I just saw it as like, I just had fun, traveled the world, went to nice restaurants, bought nice things. And then, you know, I had a retirement account, but that's it. And I never even thought about investing in anything else, maybe besides stocks or something, but. What changed? What changed was 
okay, then we started. It took us like six months because we put in like seven offers. Seven offers. That was the time. Yeah. We started in May and then didn't close till October because that was that weird time in San Diego where there was so much going on. But so then I slowly started to save up. Um, and then we did have enough, you know, for like the earnest money. Like that's how little we had, you know? Yeah. Um, and then we got money back at closing. And then when we you know, we're in this house with a mortgage. And when I realized, I'm like, okay, if I go spend a hundred dollars, you know, on a purse or spend a hundred dollars on a dinner or whatever, that's a hundred dollars taken away from my investment into this home. So when I started seeing it that way, that's when everything changed for me. Um, and my mindset of like spending and saving changed. And it changed pretty dramatically. Cause when you put yourself in that situation, you're like, okay, this has to work. Like we have to make our mortgage payment. And we have to fix that because we bought a fixer up and like we have to fix this house. Yeah. So I, I have a follow up question. Yeah. Three years later now, how glad are you that you changed that mindset and relationship with money? It's so interesting because when you're in that place and you have that mindset of just spending and not saving and seeing it as a tool, you're in the same place. So you know, you'll be in the same place for your whole life unless you switch your mindset. And now here we are with, you know, multiple properties and, you know, over a million dollars in net worth because of that mindset shift, mindset shift. But if I didn't do that, I'd be in the same place with all these, you know, maybe cool experiences and lifestyle, but no money. Yeah. You, you know, it, it, it's funny. I, I think I look at so much social media and they glorify entrepreneurship. Brad, this is for you. Mm -hmm. Um, I watch your stories every day. Doesn't look like much fucking glory. No offense, <laughs> but seems like a lot of freaking sweat, a lot of work. Can you talk about that? Like, yeah, yeah. easy, easy million. Has it been easy during the past no. three years for no. you? Guys? No, no, it hasn't it's been crazy. Easy? Yeah. I mean, it. I can relate back to the yoga studio. Yeah. It's like, I, I had to still have another job for the first three years of owning the yoga studio because we made no money, you know? And then even when I was able to quit my job, I only got paid two grand a month to live off the yoga studio, you know, which in San Diego and your rent's $1,200 a month, you know, it's like, okay, so then you got $800 to live. So I always kept other gigs and stuff. And so as I've gotten to see where we are now and where I was back then, I see what entrepreneurship, not what it's supposed to be, but like the beginning stage of it, it's, you know, sleeping under your desk, sleeping in a rental that's like unfinished. It's, you know, working all night to put together furniture until you get to that point. So like that entrepreneur lifestyle that people love is the further down the road. And that's what I think I was getting caught into because it's also a mind shift. It going back to that again, it's like you want to work in that point, but you also have to get to a point where you can start growing to have other people do those jobs that you're spending all night doing right. or all day doing so that you can work on the business. But in the beginning, there's no glory in that. In fact, it's it's way worse than working for a W-2. 100% because you're, you're doing way all this worse. work yeah. and you're not guaranteed any money at all. In yeah. fact, you're giving all your money in yeah. with a hop, with a, a hope and a prayer and a hard work that it's going to come back to you. Like you don't know. Yeah, until you can... The, the 80, 20% until you can get a point of where you can give the 80% of work that doesn't give you the most ROI to, off to someone else. So that's what we're trying to reach. We're constantly trying to reach. But I, but unless you have a lot of capital as an entrepreneur, like initially you have to do that, like grunt 80% of work yourself. Yeah. So, so you're replacing the cattle, uh, cap, uh, uh, capital with hard work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that's what you have, you know, and I'm trying to make it simple for for all the families that I serve, you know, um, here's the thing. If you don't have capital, what do you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to look, you said, I didn't look at money as a tool. I look at it as let's have some fun. Exactly. <laughs> Walk around, man. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything's like that. I mean, a hammer is only as good as what you do. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Been hammering. laughs> um, I just, I think what intrigues me about 
you know, even here in the story now, because I didn't dive into it because I was saving it for here. I didn't know you all of this started like you didn't have enough money for Ernest. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. It's crazy. That was 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not that far. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. It's not that long ago. Mm -mm. I know. It blows my mind every day. So that's um, that's also something um, we have been trying to appreciate is the gap in the gain of look, trying to be in the gain of like seeing how far we've come in three years yeah. versus always looking like, man, I should be here, man. I should be here. Cause that's yeah. too negative. And that, that, but appreciating how far we've come in a couple yeah. of years. Measuring yourself to where you were versus measuring yourself to where you're going. And so can, can I share with you, there are people that do real estate as professionals for a living that have not achieved the success that you guys have achieved. So that talks about your network, the people. So kind of like, how did the whole thing transpire with white feathers? Cause I'm really impressed by the community. That's what I care about is the, it's all about people. I joke around that I sell money, but really what I do is I help people achieve their goals for their life mm -hmm. to achieve yeah. happiness. That's really what I do. I care about people. The rest takes care of itself. I don't care what you sell. Mm -hmm. Like as long as you put people at the center of everything. So wh who are the people that change things for you guys? You know, that you were able to achieve this. Yeah. So we, we were driving up to like Lake Arrowhead, I think for like a week, cause we we're really into camping and like outdoor stuff. Um, when we had, now we'll eventually get back to that. Um, having time to camp and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> In five years. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But anyways, uh, we were listening to a podcast and that's when we first started thinking about, oh, we have this, we just bought this house and like we can do something with this, hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then we heard Buddy rushing on a podcast uh, talking about just very inspiring Shut like, up. financial freedom. I didn't even know what financial freedom was or like how, like it was just some term that I just thought was like mystical and that people just like, said you know what i'm saying yeah it had no like depth behind it it was but it was very interesting um the podcast and then you talked about this accelerator and like military you know whatever so then like literally the next day i like booked a call or whatever got on a call with them and they're like yeah well you know it's this much money a month and i'm like i don't care we're gonna do it like this is what we're gonna do how come you made that decision? First, I had no idea you connected with Buddy Rushing on a podcast. How ironic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, he was, we heard him on a podcast. Well, I'm saying you yeah, heard him yeah. on. Yeah. Well, that's, you ended up connecting yeah. the next yeah. day. Exactly. Mm -hmm. how, what podcast was it? Jay's. It was Jay Johnson's podcast. It was. And is that how. Expertish. Did you know Jay prior to that? No. Nope. Someone, no freaking way. Yeah. yeah. Someone who, one of my friends was like, hey you're you just bought a house you should listen to this podcast because it it was like a, he's in the navy type of thing yeah that is freaking cool. yeah yeah it's a wild and now like, jay connection. now jay's our partner our oh i know yeah. and buddy's you know a good friend and we've been through so much with him but that's how we got connected with buddy in the first place we listened to one podcast one podcast so and then we our lives then we decided to <laughs> <laughs> then we decided to join the accelerator program yeah and that set us on a path that, you know, we, here we are now. It's crazy because that's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Now, right now, I just want you guys to know that podcast. Just do that. Um, so you didn't know Jay until you listened to this podcast. And now what, when was that? 2020, 2021. When'd you guys buy your first place? October, 2020 is when we closed. Perfect. So I forgot if we did that joined in January or I June. Joined in January. I forgot if it was January or June. One of those. So it's 2021. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because we didn't meet Jay until we were out of the accelerator and we were like doing a COVID summit. And then he was, we were on, on a Zoom call and then like Jay and us wanted to connect. And then we started going to his meetups and met him. And yeah. Because he has some a great, his own community. You, military. You, you owe her even more now. Like she picked up the phone the next yeah, day. She's like, yeah. buddy, we're in. Yeah. 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 That, what did, uh, what gravitated you? What would sit out about that podcast that made you want to, cause you took action right away. So what was it? That's interesting. I haven't thought about that. And I don't know, maybe you can talk about that more, but I just remember like, he just had some 
really interesting life experiences of like utilizing an RV and renting out an RV. And then I don't. He just had this like kind of unstoppable charisma. And he's mm. like, we're doing this. And at that point, I think he's like, we have an RV. We're going to rent that out. And I've got this uh, house and I'm renting out the backs and Airbnb. And he just has this positive energy and he's got, and once we learned even more so, it's just this take action. Just, he always preaches take action. And I think we can relate to that. And maybe we picked up on that subconsciously, but he just, his vibe and everything was just like, oh, this, this guy's great. Like, let's give him a call. And then you get around him, you get to meet him and you're like, I don't even know how to put him in a category of, you can't, you know, it's just, it's, it's the buddy effect. He's just awesome. It is the buddy effect. And then you meet Kimberly. Yeah. And then you add that to the equation. And you're like, this is unreal. Yeah. Like th this is, this is a joke. Like, yeah. I don't like, that's how incredible they are. And it's like, I think I'm drawn to people like that. Yeah. That charisma, that energy, that positivity that I'm here to make a difference yeah. for people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what, yeah, it was the take action. Cause I'm like, Oh, that's all I have to do is take action. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but for people, like when we have taken action our whole lives in different realms, I'm like, Oh, if this is all I have to do is just take one step forward and just keep stepping forward. I'm like, okay, what? Well, I guess what we need to do. Cause otherwise we'll just be staying in the same place the rest of I, our lives. You, you were talking to me about something. You're like, Hey, I talked to all my uh, friends, family that I love and I care about, and I'm trying to talk to them about real estate. And that's the toughest part of already. Like it's that first step. Like, yeah. It's the fear that prevents us from taking that first step. And the journey doesn't begin until the first step. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You just got to do it. Yeah. And and what I realized too is like, okay, I'm 32 now, but back then I think I guess it was like 29. Right. I'm like, what's the risk? I have the rest, you know, I have the rest of my life. Okay, Amen. I lose all my money now. I just start over. There's, there's, yeah. You know, so I might as well take the risk. <laughs> This girl's wise. Like she's right. <laughs> like all you 20 year olds, like real estate is not a losing bet in California. You you brought it up. The equity in itself, because there's no supply. And as long as there's no supply, home prices, like I know people are appalled. I feel bad for you. I wish the state would actually do shit to build more. They don't. And if they don't like it, do something about it. Like it, it's it's not right. Like we are driving people out of the state because there's no housing. Five grand, uh, Brad, what do you think that place rents for now in PB today? Yeah, Do you exactly. know what I mean? Like yeah. that's just not reality. Most people can't live like yeah. that. Brad, what, what, what stood out? Was that the best money that you've ever spent with White Feather? That would be the best money ever spent because that was the seed that sparked the growth for the investments that we've made along the way. And so, yeah, I, I can't imagine any other money that I've ever spent that would be investing in yourself. And it doesn't have to be just that accelerator, but that accelerator for us and others is this giant spark that lights it up. But investing in yourself and learning that is like, there's no greater value in that. But especially now, cause I'm like, man, if we didn't do that, we wouldn't have this guy that was like, make the offer, push, take action. And, you know, and it's like the people that were in our group that have done that are, you know, like you're so much further along than would you would have ever been in life. You know, it's like, it's crazy to think about that. If it's crazy sitting in that chair, imagine sitting in this chair where I'm in real estate and I'm blown away by what you guys are doing. Blown away, like it blows my mind. I'm like, how is this fucking possible? No, I'm serious, the whole entire group. I'm like, what in the world is going on? I've changed my, by the way, I don't think you know this. I've changed my whole entire perspective on real estate since I met all of you guys. Wow. Oh, yeah. From, oh, because you were saying. Well, what's your, now you're starting to go to real estate events. Yeah. What have you learned? The first introduction mm -hmm. was White Feather, Buddy Rushing, Kimberly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now you're going to real estate events. And what do you see? What's the difference? Yeah. So all <laughs> we've known in real estate, because our first interaction of real estate, minus like his um, good friend was a real estate agent and he's super awesome. He just ended up moving away. But 
but that was a really positive interaction. And then the second interaction was doing the accelerator. And that's all we knew. And this community of like-minded military people uh, who are amazing. And all we've known is that community. And so when we started doing our own thing and breaking out and seeing other real estate communities, we're like, wow, this is very, the white feather is very, very special because mm -hmm. everyone's so. authentic mm -hmm. and they're there to help and they're not egotistical. They're humble and they just want to help other people and inspire other people versus the other side of real estate is very egotistical and they just care about themselves. Right. I have a question for you, Brad. Would you had you been introduced to the real estate events prior to White Feather? Would that have turned you off from making decisions? Um. Yes and no. I think I've even the real estate events that we've went to outside of White Feather. Some yeah. of them haven't been. They're not like horrible, but like maybe the one event that we went to recently. If that was the only thing I ever knew, that wouldn't have left me with a warm and fuzzy feeling at the end versus white feather has had like a backboard of people you can ask people you can rely on you understand and they understand that like there's a trust and bond there it's just it's very it's unique i guess but to us it's just all we knew I you know. know so after going to a couple of them you're like no nah, that kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth but there's other events i went to that are outside of white feather they've been great yeah they've been awesome so i can't speak to all of them like that of course but we not. definitely got very lucky in finding that community is our first real estate community yeah. for sure the reason i ask that question is i think as a real estate professional i have a responsibility to educate people on their goals and what's in their best interest and i just don't know if my community does that really well mm -hmm. yeah in the client's best interest yeah, yeah. so now i'm advocating for for people that are in the community that I believe in, you mm -hmm. know, and I'm advocating for that because I do think real estate can change lives. Like mm -hmm. there is not a question. This is not, I used to think, yeah, there's a lot of risk with buying a house. There is a lot of risk with buying a house, but you just have to have solutions to what mm -hmm. your goals are. Mm -hmm. And so you work with people that listen to you, care about you, get to know you. They're going to give you solutions based on what your goals are. If you work with people that just want money, they're always going to want you to buy. Mm -hmm. And to me, I am not one of those people. I do not think that is the right time to buy for everyone. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on your particular situation. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, hundred percent. So different. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Especially with our military community. Like, uh, I, I always start with financial education. Like, I think that's a huge like need for a lot of people. Like, your attachment to money blows my mind away. You know what I mean? Like, that's pretty norm. That's the normal. Like we make money to spend money. Mm -hmm. I've been like that for a yeah. long time. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. What what's so got into White Feather, had built out a portfolio. What's next? You guys got a badass project in Julian. Julian. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk about that. Like, how did that manifest itself? Cause you talked about Jay. That's a project you guys are working on together, right? Yeah. 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 So We've been looking in Julian for actually for a while, for like it was like five months. Nice. Mm -hmm. Um, and then and we were putting offers on places and stuff like that. And he's our real estate agent yeah. now. Um, and then and he just like wanted to partner. Nice. And we're like dope because we this there was a couple of things that came on the market that we really liked, and thank God we didn't get into those other deals. We got into this very, very special okay. A-frame log cabin. Yeah. It's like 2,100 square feet over Lake Cuyamaca, and it is so freaking special. And then Jay was like, yeah, let's be partners. So um, he was able to do like the vacation home, you know, the 10% down vacation home, which is a great because if it, we had to do 20%, the numbers wouldn't have worked as well. That would Yeah, second be. home, 10% option. Yeah. And really when cool. did you close on this place? Was it in August? I think so. August. Okay, good. Yeah. So like yeah. four months ago. And yeah. about like once the rehab is done, that refinance goes through. Nice. Yeah, we're going to um, refinance once the rates go down. And Yeah. yeah. Well, Which it's we're in working no in rush. your favor right now. They're, yeah. They're... They're steadily heading in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. So, and what's really nice, we really like value add projects. Okay. So, meaning like, 
yeah. we buy a place that needs, you know, some value add, whether it's you put ADU on it or whether you fix it up. So this log cabin, apparently it was burned down. What okay. was like in the 2003 fire? Yeah, there was wow. the, I forget the name of the fire that ripped yeah. through. I was at college then, but it ripped through that whole community and they rebuilt the house in 2006 or seven. Yeah. Cool. So it's, it's cool. It's, a, it's a, it got really good bones and foundation. Nice. Um, and, but it just needed to be updated. You know, it was a second home family vacation that was decorated by grandma and grandpa, which was cool. Like it was move in ready if you wanted to, but if you're going to try to make it this lux upscale, very market competitive Airbnb or short-term rental, um, then it needed quite a bit of work. And the outside, the landscaping needed a ton of work. Oh yeah. yeah. And the outside of the house needed a ton of work yeah. because it was like woodpeckers had completely, <laughs> there was water damage from all these woodpeckers. And there was, they pulled a log out and like a thousand acorns fell out of oh, the really? house. Yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah. yeah. They just made it their second home for storing all their nuts for winter. And it's like, it's sweet. It's crazy. So, but that created all sorts of problems. So anyways, this, property and stuff that we look at right now to stay on the safer side of real estate is buying something that we can put some or force some equity by improving. Yeah. So if something doesn't go right, you know, you can still get out because you've made that value go up. Yeah. You know? We always have multiple exits on every, but this one's going to again, Aubrey. Oh, we always have multiple exits on every deal. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. See, and that's like, where did you pick that up from? Like, is it from podcasts? Is it from your network? Like, where'd you, I'm all about the multiple outs in real estate. Cause there's so many factors that you can account for mm -hmm. and everyone makes it seem like, Oh no, 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 we got you. No, 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 no. We don't have you. Like <laughs> shit's going to go wrong. Like be real. Yeah. Uh, you work with problem solvers and then you figure out. So what, what made that happen? So we are inherently pretty risky, but I'm not going to okay. be risky enough to only have one solution to a problem. Yeah. Like I'm not that risky. Yeah. I want to have multiple solutions to a problem. So we will never buy a place that only has one solution. So, which was one of the offers we were going to put in, but the it was like a tree house or whatever. So when this one came along, it is good enough to like put value into it and be able to sell it for more, which okay. was really great because there were places out in Julian where you can't do that. Really? There was no What's cost. the estimate you think once you guys are done with, uh, is this a full rehab or pretty is it much. pretty much? Yeah. Okay. What, what quantifies a full rehab? Just so, cause here's the thing. Like I, I think what's cool about your story is your novices. You just started in 2020. So who better, like, I don't care about real estate people giving me advice. Like they've been in the business. You're beginners. Like you're, I think you bring way more value to, to the beginner, the neophyte investor that's too afraid to take risk. I'd say the full rehab is, if you wanted to like quantify it, yeah. it's like 60 or 70% of the property is touched in one way or another, whether okay. it be paint or full remodels of bathroom or landscaping or whatnot. I, I would assume like this one, we've redone something in every room nice. and the entire outside has been redone in every way imaginable. So Brad did that himself, by the way. Yeah, that one was weird. <laughs> Brad's a real man. Just want you to know that. <laughs> All you got to go is go on his stories. You'll see it every freaking day. Um, I think that to me quantify. I'm sure there's no like, what's a full rehab, what's not. Maybe if you just did like isolated, just did the kitchen, just yeah. did uh, upgraded the master bathroom or something like that. But when you start talking about the entire place is in shambles and then you put it all back together, that to me is kind of like full rehab. Yeah, because that looks like a full rehab, mm -hmm. you know, the Julian Price. Yeah. It really does because you, you guys are working on everything. I've seen the yeah. landscaping. I've seen the light. I, I, I love it because you're taking something that, you know, pretty much and it had opportunities like everybody lives different. Mm -hmm. And now you're you're scaling it up and you're creating value. Um, what do you think that's going to, when did you start the project? When did you get August? Uh, August. Yeah. And when do you think it's going to be done? Well, we it's supposed to be done like a month ago. Okay. In December. It just always pushes, you know, um, always, always. I think it will be done in, in two weeks. I think Sweet. so. Because I think so. Congrats. We'll have yeah. to celebrate that yeah, like right great. before the holidays. Yeah. Huh? That's yeah. our goal. Well, my goal was December 1st and now it's December 15th. Okay. So we'll see if we can hit that. But definitely our big goal is before the holidays. Sweet. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so you want to rent it out before. Yeah. yeah. Or up and running. I want to see that available. view. 
yeah, viewers in person. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Come on up, please. Oh, we're gonna yeah. bring a videographer. 100%. Like I'm gonna do the. We'll bring Luca. Yeah, Luca. It's right, it's epic, good. and it's cool too because once you get out towards Julian area and you get off the eight or whatever major freeway and you start, it's like a whole different countryside vibe, and especially by the lake is really I'm cool. In. It opens up, and you've got this like really epic field that rolls through into a mountain that you can hike up or they've got like a waterfall you can hike down to and then there's the lake and the restaurant on the lake it's just i just like, gave you my credit card it's a cool it, it's just a cool vibe that yeah. i didn't really know i like i knew i liked it but once you're out there you're like oh this is like wow yeah. i'll bring the great sick. goose yes yeah. <laughs> and there's all speaking of which there's like wild geese that run around and oh, turkeys yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. and like, turkey. i heard there's wild turkeys out there that's insane there are neighbors there's a whole pack and they just wander around the neighborhood yeah there's like 20 of them yeah okay so here's the most important question how many weekends will you be spending yeah <laughs> you know it's gonna it's gonna be hard hopefully none because it's, it's yeah. rented out that's the okay. uh, bittersweet how, so let me <laughs> ask you a question how much uh what like what do you estimates right now projections so, how many days a month do you think you'll have a rented out well our goal is like at yeah. least 80 percent occupancy perfect but it's always what i've learned it's always a fine line between occupancy and average daily rate because you yeah. can have 30 percent occupancy and make more right than if you had 80 percent occupancy at a lower rate so we're always trying to balance that um my initial goal was 100k of gross income and that was Okay. But now I see the potential of it and we have some really unique marketing strategies for it because we want to make this a destination, Okay, which cool. is all we want to work on now is just unique properties and unique experiences to stand out because of the, we want people to come travel. This is such a unique property. Like it is just mind blowing to me. I get it. You know, Ooh, look at your mind. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. So you're going to pick out unique properties mm -hmm. and unique properties are harder to sell to your, you know, and that's what most, I think people that are not in real estate, unique properties are harder to sell. So if you turn those into Airbnb and places mm -hmm. that are open to it, like that's, that's a badass idea. That's a unique niche. Yeah. It's definitely a niche. It helps a lot too. Cause you see Huge. something that's like. When you want to go stay on a vacation, it's cool to stay in something very different than what you are accustomed to living in. You want to have that, or at least what we want to stay in is curate unique experiences. And so there's other properties that were out there that had unique something, this or the other. But like, how often do you get to stay in an A-frame cabin that has, Gorgeous you know, views. rad views and a wraparound deck or how often you get to go to a place that has you know like there's cool tile everywhere and unique lighting and that that just experience is easier to sell and i think people want that more and will pay more to have that versus yeah. like staying at grandma and grandpa's like second home that it's like it's cool at the area you're in is cool but right the stay you would never take pictures in it and be pumped on it you're creating experience for for the guest instead of like renting out your second home Exactly. which is for you yeah that's not a do you see what i'm saying so it's a completely different model yes, and i love the unique strategy yeah that's great yeah because we want to optimize the revenue of ourselves and the investor and i want to create like cool experiences and i yeah. love bringing in like my friends or you know we're having one of our best buds build a coffee table like know. A, you know a custom <laughs> coffee table and then i use my one of my best friends, he opened a coffee shop. We use his coffee beans for all our rentals, like bringing in the local culture. And then what's really cool about the Julian place, our cross the street neighbor, he has a food company. So we're going to utilize him to do private oh. dinner, charcuterie. Like, Do you want to know something? I was going to yeah. ask you, what impact are you going to make to the community? And you said it, you're going to go local. So you're bringing in everything local to the theme. I love that. You know, yeah. and I think this is where like impact begins. You know, you talked about ROI, which is return on investment. I'm all about ROI, return on impact. And it's not just you're buying lodging. And I think this is where investors, like you're making a difference in that community. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be money coming in. There's, they're gonna go out and spend money. And, mm -hmm. and that's where growth happens. And that's what big corporations are doing is like, oh, no problem. You don't want to buy houses? We'll go buy them. Mm -hmm. And you will pay rent forever because there's no supply. They're not yeah. stupid. Yeah.
Well, every time you forget as the investor, you're creating its own little economy for four months. You yeah. know, like you're talking about all the contractors, all the painters that have come up, all the electricians that have come up to get work that are local. And then you talk about photographers and then they all have to go eat somewhere. And then when people stay at your place, they all need to go out and experience things in the town. And that all creates revenue for people who live there. Yeah. And especially in a place like Julian, it's it's not a lot of people live there. Everybody comes to visit there. So the more that you can bring in that for the community, the better. And so it's like a win-win. And this property that was a little dilapidated now becomes awesome. And so all the neighbors trying to sell their homes have something that they can up their value with because their neighbor across the street fixed up that place. And the cool thing is you're like doing a great outdoors and shit because what's going to happen is a family will stay there. They'll talk about the amazing experience they had because it's a theme, mm -hmm. you know, really cool place. And then they tell their family and friends and that's how you create memories and make a difference. Yeah. Like it becomes the experience. Yeah. Yeah. And we, and that's a huge, I really <laughs> want to, I want to create these memorable experiences for people. Yeah. I want to have some kind of positive impact because honestly, like the most thing, the thing I'm most passionate about is the environment. But until I really, and yeah, until I can get there to where I can buy Virginia Farms, I want to at least have some kind of positive impact on my way, which is okay. creating these. You haven't talked about that. I didn't know you were an environmentalist. What What do you, what, what, what's so passionate? What, what are you so passionate about the environment for? Um, Because I don't, where it's going right now of like the carbon emissions, human health, you know, 33% of kids are pre-diabetic now, you know, all of that, all of that in the foods, it's all of the food system and agricultural and the United States and the world is probably about like 30% of carbon emissions. And that's all because of commercial farming and all that commercial farming is just feeding the pre-diabetic children that corn, soybean oil. I grew up in a corn and soybean farm we do have that farm now, my siblings and I, so we're going to try to turn it regenerative. But like, I want to have some sort of impact of making a better life for the future generations and for the planet. And that is kind of like our end goal, but we're using this as a tool to get there for the income. I love it. It's not, it's not about money for you. No. You know, and that that's, I think, a beautiful thing. And when you talk about the environment, it's funny how I think when you monetize something, that's when you corrupt it. Mm -hmm. And food is 100%, like it's money driven. You know, I look at the health habits of my of my kids and that starts with me as a parent. I'm like, holy shit, I have terrible eating habits. Look at, <laughs> guess what they're learning from? <laughs> so now that I have much better eating habits, guess what? My 13 year old said to me, Trevor's like, hey dad, I'm not gonna be eating past 8 p.m. I did watch a YouTube channel, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, so he's focused on his, like do you know how freaking great it is to have your kid turn around to you and not talk to you about a video game or something like that? Those are, so I'm, I'm all about the environment and going back to this like, dude, you can't put poison in everything and expect it to work comment. out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's poison into the earth too, which is a huge thing. Thank you. And that poison yeah. into the earth is also poisoning the children and creating cancer and all these long-term negative effects. But yeah, yeah. And, and and corporations will tell you no, it's safe and all that stuff. No, it's safe as long as they make money. Yeah, yeah. like exactly. I'm, I'm just yeah. that. That's a reality. Yeah. You know, money unfortunately rules a lot of decision making, and I think. It's people standing up and saying, hey, I'm going to go achieve success in life mm -hmm. so I can have a platform of change. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, it's that cool. next hill horizon thing. Yeah. So you get over the one hill, then it's like, okay, now I have time freedom, going back to what we talked about, of now I want to tackle this problem. Now I want to tackle this problem. And I think that the way that we are farming and feeding ourselves is a downward spiral that if it were to stay this way, we're all fucked. So unless we start actually increasing people's habits in a better way, and so that's either leading the way or it might actually be monetizing things that are way more healthy so that the economy is forced to go yeah. towards regenerative farming that is good for our gut biome, which also increases our mood, which helps fight depression across kids across America. So it's like it's a weird – sphere but it's all connected anyways yeah but i think and this is just me that if you can get the economies to sway towards things that are more healthy for the planet 
you know, that's what's leading industries. And so if all of a sudden Walmart's just like, oh, well, then we just buy everything regenerative because it makes more money. Then it's like, well, that's a win-win for everybody versus buying the cheapest, crappiest product out there just to make the most yeah. money, you know? To me, like cheapest, I associate with like, <clears throat> you're just not going to, you're not paying for quality. Yes. You're just not, mm -hmm. you know, and it's so funny. It, now my relationship with food has really changed. You know, my relationship with food, like I wouldn't have any problem going, spending $200 going out, but now I'm not going to pay 10 bucks for something that's actually good for me. That doesn't make, that doesn't compute any longer. Mm -hmm. So I'm all about cooking and I teach the boys how to cook because mm -hmm. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like you got to learn how to cook yeah. and then you know what's going in your food. Because mm -hmm. that, that's what you eat every single day. Your body lives off that. And if it's just living off of glyphosate and junk and corn and yeah. seed oils. Thank you. You know, where yeah. are you going to be when you're 40, 50? Trevor, Trevor's reading labels. Oh. Nice. I'm that's a huge a fan. Yeah, that, that's at 13, huge. that's awesome. Well, I, and where do you think he got it from? Because his dad reads labels all the time. Like mm -hmm. he cooks with me and and I'm a, I had no idea. This is actually a beautiful tangent that we went on, which is I was really curious about your purpose. Like how come you're so driven in life to achieve financial freedom and there's a bigger purpose? Yeah, I think there always has to be a bigger purpose. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, what's your bigger purpose? I mean, I'm right there with her on the side of creating healthy habits. And I'm also in this point where we're so focused on step A to get to step E. I don't know what that thing's going to be, but I, I know that the way that we are currently working and looking at things that... Each year, if I try to project where I'm going to be in my mindset in five years, nearly impossible. Yeah. But I do know that for me, the financial time freedom is going to open up this different vision of, okay, now I have that resource at my disposal that I can put into these things. So I know that's going to change over time. And I know that that's going to evolve into this guy that I can't even imagine I'm going to be in five years after, uh, you know, some kind of cause I want to go after. But I do know one of the things I'm very passionate about is health and mindset. And I think yeah. that stems from food. And I really want to take some of these regenerative farms and meld it with real estate and put people to be able to stay there and see how this is done and have a, what is it, a farm stay kind of experience really? mixed with a short-term run agro-tourism so people can connect and they can see the farm, they can fall in love with that process, they can share that with others, and it becomes this kind of positive, like, hey, have you stayed at that farm? That's really cool, Airbnb, and they've got, maybe you've got a little, um, some of these places, like we traveled to, had a cool, uh, like, cider house, or they had a, what was it? It was a brewery on there. And he, but you got to be surrounded by the rest of the farm that was regenerative or is working its way towards that. And I think that's such a cool thing that I never grew up with in California. We don't have that experiences in the on the coastal side of it. But to bring that to more people and get a business spin on it, I think that would be really cool. And I think you could meld the dream of regenerative with real estate on the same thing. Well, I have you saying that on a podcast. So you're going to make this happen because we have evidence and you're going <laughs> to manifest this because I want to take my kids there. I've been watching Yellowstone uh -huh. and I'm fuck. Have your kids been watching Yellowstone? No, I've just been watching Yellowstone. <laughs> so the ironic thing is I want to move to Montana yeah. and I had no idea about yeah. like, everybody's been talking about Yellowstone. I just haven't watched it and I killed I killed it. It was pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's funny, the freedom that comes from the outdoors. Like I'm such, I'm going to be moving to Montana. I'm going to have a place in Montana. Like that's just my thing. Like to me, a beautiful day is grab my coffee, go outside, sit on the porch, look at beauty, look at nature, think about your mindset and the impact that I'm going to make mm -hmm. on this world. And you can, now you can do it anywhere, mm -hmm. you know? And I think everyone's definition of happiness. So like that hard work throughout that, that, that was beautiful. Like that's how they became hard because mm -hmm. they did hard shit every day. Mm -hmm. And like, when you talk about kids, like, do you know why I would take my kids to there? Cause they could get out there and get their hands dirty mm -hmm. and, and know what hard work is. And the earlier they start, the better off they are. Mm -hmm. You know, world's going to eat 
some of our kids alive. Mm-hmm. It's rough. Yeah. I spent like my whole time on the farm dreaming my whole life just as a little girl in pink as a fairy tale princess. <laughs> like, I, you know, so when, when people from my hometown are like, you're a freaking helicopter pilot because I was just some like prissy wow. little girl. Seriously. Yeah. I know they're like, what? <laughs> um, I just dreamed when I was on the farm of leaving the farm every single minute I was on there, even though it was incredible and we had so much fun. Um, and then now I've been away. I'm like, all I wanted to do is go back. Yeah. You know, isn't that insane? I know. It's so crazy. So, we're going to do this again. What do you think about coming back in two to three months? Because at that point, say every time you have a new project, we'll, we'll go through things. Because mm-hmm. I think this is the this is the journey of how you go from net net uh, net zero net zero to in twenty twenty three, roughly in four, three years. Look at what what has happened. And mm-hmm. I think this, these are the cool stories that you got to tell because anyone's, these opportunities are open to anyone. You just yeah. got to do the sacrifice and the hard work. And I think that's, that. The, the story was even better than what I expected, by the way. Like I had no <laughs> many, I didn't realize the layers and all that stuff. And what's incredible about both of you is that you're amazing people. No, like you're good yeah. people. You know what I mean? Like, those are the those are the people now I adv- advocate for in all our communities. Like these people are doing things for the right reasons. I'm all about the love.